The following is intended for mature audiences only. Discretion is advised. Good evening, Comedy House New Orleans. Welcome to this very special taping of the So What Do You Really Do podcast. Without any further ado, please give yourselves a round of applause for your host, Dead Air Dennis Maller. so much for being here. This is great. This is fantastic. It is my first live podcast recording, so thank you guys for coming and being a part of it. This is fantastic. However, if none of you showed up, it would have been like every other podcast I've ever done. So <laughs> the fact that you're here has now made it different, and that frightens me. That's, uh, that is what is going to be happening. And I have to do my special introduction that I do every intro, uh, show, so now that you guys are here, we're ready. Let's do this. Thank you so much for coming out to the live taping of So What Do You Really Do? The podcast where I, your host, Dead Air Dennis Maller, talks to artists and entertainers about their day jobs. And the artists and entertainers and day jobs that we will be talking about, uh, we have um, two amazing comedians who are a part of the festival. We have a Rosie Tran and we have Meryl Clamell coming out a little bit later. Uh, for time being, I am your host, Dead Air Dennis Maller. Uh, I am excited to be here in New Orleans. Uh, for the first time, this has been great. Thank you for having me, New Orleans. I'm uh, staying at a hotel just around the corner, uh, and it is a beautiful, lovely hotel to be stuck into a shower unconscious and have your liver removed. It's a very spooky place right now. Ha I am on the eighth floor. There are 34 rooms on there, and I am room 34. It's, they literally, I showed up 15 minutes before checkout, like, we're gonna give you the last possible room available. And it is a lovely room with a beautiful view of a building next door. <laughs> like, honestly, if I was a pervert, it would have been the perfect room. It was it's absolutely wonderful. And of course, on the other side of my hotel room is another window that overlooks the other building next to it. <laughs> I am in a hotel between two alleys on both sides. It's very sketch, and I love it. Uh, it's nice to be here in New Orleans for the first time. It uh, Actually, I... Everyone talks about New Orleans. Everyone tells me that it's a great place. Everyone tells me that it is wonderful and then like the drinking on the streets. Uh, and I am pleasantly surprised that the city does not smell like stale beer and vomit everywhere. It is absolutely delightful. I can't wait to take some more uh, tours and stuff uh, and see a couple of the other things. So it is nice. Uh, thank you for having me. Are we have any New Orleans residents here? Anyone make some noise if you're here from New Orleans? Uh, the, the drunken woos of New Orleans residents. I love it, excellent. Uh, so let's talk about the podcast for those uh, give a big round of silence if you've listened to my podcast before <laughs> no <it's, laughs> excellent no the, so here's the podcast the podcast is called so what do you really do I, as an artist and entertainer, speaks to other artists and entertainers about our day jobs. We talk about the stuff that we have to do during the day to support what we want to do at night. All right, this is the way the podcast came about. I've worked in the radio industry for over 20 years. Technically, I started a podcast like in 2001 when no one knew what podcasts were. I didn't know what I was doing. Like I was literally recording radio shows and putting them on MySpace. That was <laughs> early podcast days is basically what that was. All right, didn't know I was doing a podcast. And throughout the years, I wanted to be able to do interviews on my own. Right, because the radio stations I worked for weren't giving me the creative freedom that I as a person needed. So, I went through years and years of thinking about what is my podcast going to be about? Because I didn't just want to be another white guy comedian with a podcast where we argue about why we should be allowed to say the N-word. That's basically what so many podcasts are right now. I didn't want to be a part of that, so I wanted to think of an interesting hook. And uh, like I said, I live, in, I live in Boston. I want to be specific, I'm not from Boston. <laughs> Do not call me a Bostonian, right? I am from Baltimore originally. I moved to Boston because I ran out of bridges to burn in Baltimore. So <laughs> I am just blowing through that town with a blowtorch. It's a wonderful uh, arson. Anyway, we're a local comedy club is having a Christmas party for comedians. I was at the party. We're all mingling and talking with other comedians. And one of the comedians I talked to uh, is a video game designer. In fact, he was the lead video game designer for a video game licensed by Marvel comic books. And I was talking, I was like, man, this is interesting. And I realized this is what my podcast is about. So many of us have interesting day jobs and careers that we do in addition to going out at night and telling jokes or going out at night and playing music or creating visual arts, being graphic designers, stuff like that. And I was like, this is what the people 
they don't understand about us. This is what the people don't get about what we as artists have to struggle through. So I decided at that moment that we were going to make the podcast. And I'm talking to another comedian. I was like, I have, a pod- I have an idea for a podcast now. And he goes, well, what you need is an interesting name. And the comedian, his name's Don Zello. And he's like, you need an interesting name. You need a name like, so what do you really do? <laughs> Because like every time you talk to an actor, they're like, oh, you're an actor. I'm like, okay, yeah, but what do you really do? Wait tables. So like that was... Now, here, the reason I tell you about where the name come from is because six months later, started the podcast, started doing episodes. I invited Don to come on because he's a real estate agent and a comedian. And we talked about his time in LA, why he moved back to Boston, so that. And as we're talking, I mentioned, I was like, well, you know you're the, the reason for the podcast starting. He goes, I am? Like, yeah, you don't remember the conversation we had? You named the podcast. Like, oh, I did? Yeah, I am pretty brilliant. And that was the, uh, the beginning of his decline as a uh, knuckle-dragging guy who's very self-assured of himself. But he's a great guy and a good comedian. So, Now, the reason I picked this podcast is, uh, topic is because me, myself, I have had interesting jobs. Like I said, I worked in radio for 20 years. I worked for iHeartRadio for 15 of those years. Right? I no longer work for them because they decided that they didn't want me anymore. But here's the thing, they, they still host my podcast, so joke's on them! <laughs> but, uh, and throughout the radio industry, in my years and that, people always, when they hear about why I work in radio, their eyes light up. They're like, oh, really? Are you, are you on the air? Sometimes I'm, I'm allowed to say yes, sometimes I'm saying no because I've done everything. I've worked on the air, I've been a producer for morning shows, I've been an engineer. Literally, the reason why I'm excited to do this podcast in a location outside of my home-built studio is so I can bring all the equipment that I've been using for work for 20 years here to make this live production. Like, literally, I just, picked, I just packed up everything from my studio at home, brought it here, and just reset it up. Like, I've been doing this as a job for 20 years. I would go to a place and I would set up. Like, one of the more interesting jobs I've had is I've recorded a live concert for Sheryl Crow for Sirius XM that they still play to this day. Like, I was literally at a bar, and I heard Sheryl Crow. I was like, hi, everybody in Washington, D.C. I'm so happy to be here on Earth Day. Here's, here's a song from, one, from my first record. And I'm like, I recorded this! So I was like, that's nice. That's delightful that they can still do that, uh, that they're still playing the things that I did. Here's the thing about... Serious XM, when they would hire me for jobs to do recordings, they would not tell me what the job is until after I've agreed to it. So it would be very secretive, like, hey, can you show up at this place at this time with this equipment? I'm like, uh, yes, I can. What am I going to do? And we'll let you know. And then I would get an email. I was like, here is a non-disclosure agreement. You're not allowed to tell anyone that you are recording our head LGBT show on Sirius XM at a huge LGBT uh, conference. And I'm like... You could have just opened with it. Like, I get it. I get what I look like. Like, if you're not, if you're listening to audio on the podcast, you can watch the podcast on Spotify and YouTube at the Big Comedy Network. Let's be honest. I just took my hat off, and I look like the cause for most people's problems. Like, <laughs> like I get it. Honestly, I look like if I told half this audience to get home safely, they would think it was a threat. So. <laughs> I can understand where they're like, hey, should we let the guy who looks like a January 6th recreationist go to the LGBT convention? Look, the check cleared, and that's all I cared about. So, uh, But I no longer work in the radio industry. I no longer work in podcasting. I left that industry, and I now have a new, more interesting day job that I never talk about on the podcast. So I feel like now's the good time to tell everyone what I do. I've mentioned it here and there, but I've never talked to it extensively. Uh, I am currently... Uh, make some noise. Do you guys know what duck boats are? Amphibious vehicles, yeah, that go through in water and then through the streets. I am a narrator on one of those in the city of Boston. Which, by the way... I'm literally giving 80 minute tours every day to the city of Boston, tell everyone how great Boston is, why I actively hate the city of Boston. (laughs) I went through two months of training to be a duck tour narrator and had to go through, I basically had to test all of the waters of what I can and cannot say uh, on these tours. And you guys get to hear the things I'm not allowed to say on tour. Here we go. One of the things I'm not allowed that I've been reprimanded in saying that I'm not allowed to say on tour is, Are we all familiar with the movie The Departed? Yeah? All right. So the movie Departed is filmed in the movie. It takes place, and it's filmed in Boston. We go by one of its locations, and, you know, it's like, here's the Hurley building. It was used in the filming of the movie The Departed. And what I'm not allowed to say is the movie Departed stars Leonardo DiCaprio, Matt Damon, and locally known racist Mark Wahlberg. (laughs) 
They got really mad at that one. Uh, one of the other things is, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about movies on this tour, and my tour is not a lot about movies, but we're going to talk about movies here. Uh, round of applause. You guys know the movie Glory. Glory. Uh, it was filmed in 1989. It partially takes place in Massachusetts. It's about the Civil War. It's actually about the very first uh, all-black volunteer regiment to train in the North and fight against the South in the Civil War. Right? We have a huge, in Boston, a huge monument dedicated to the Massachusetts 54th uh, Regiment. And it's actually called the Robert Gould Shaw Massachusetts 54th Memorial. Robert Gould Shaw is the leader of that regiment. He's played by uh, Ferris Bueller in the movie Glory. He also stars uh, Denzel Washington, Morgan Freeman. Uh, and it's the most Boston thing to make, a reg to make a monument to dedicate to the very first all black volunteer regiment to fight in the Civil War and then name it after the one white guy in the regiment, Robert Gould Shaw. <laughs> They also did not like that one. They also hate when I point out that Massachusetts was the first state to abolish slavery here in America. It was also the first colony to legalize it. So, ah, uh, yeah, they really like, no, 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 don't remind people of that one. Don't remind people of that one. And then lastly, the last thing that uh, I'm not allowed to say on tour is uh, Paul Revere, American hero, right? Love him. He's great. Boston, he was born and raised in Boston. He's a hero of the American Revolution. Uh, he was also born uh, the son of a French immigrant. He paid for a lot of things that happened during the revolution. He financed a lot of things. He was also a silversmith, goldsmith, coppersmith, friends with Will Smith, <laughs> amateur dentist, right? And they really hate when I refer to him as the Elon Musk of the American Revolution. <laughs> But uh, those are the things that I'm not allowed to say on my tour where I dress as a punk rock ukuleleist. I know. There's a lot of self deprecating humor in our characters of, at Boston Duck Tour, and I drive around the city letting people know. Uh, the things that I'm allowed to say, the, all the heritage of the city of Boston. Uh, so it's been a fun job that I absolutely love. It's literally an 80 minute comedy show driving around Boston talking about history, and I'm absolutely, it's honestly one of the best jobs I've ever had, and I'm, I'm so happy to be doing it, um, because it brings my love of comedy to my hatred of history. <laughs> <laughs> I learned enough history just to be able to write jokes about it, that's it. Like, everyone else in the company loves history, I'm like, nope, I'm here for jokes, I'm like, yeah, well this is more a history tour than a comedy tour, and I keep telling the boss that you hired the wrong guy, so, anyway. Uh, that aside, thank you so much for you guys being here for the live taping. Let's also give a round of applause to the staff here at Comedy House NOLA uh, and the Hell Yes Festival for inviting me to do this. It's fantastic and wonderful. They, they really believed in me. Uh, and uh, my podcast is now published by the Big Comedy Network, and they are also somebody who saw my talent during the, the performing online and Zoom shows and, and uh, Clubhouse shows, and they're like, Dennis is amazing talent. More people should know who he is and what he's doing, and they've been working uh, to help promote me uh, and get my podcast into more ears and more eyes. So thank you to them. Thank you to Hell, Fest for, uh, Hell Yes Fest for doing this. Give them again, uh, the club, a big round of applause. And without any further ado, let's bring out our guests. We're going to go ahead and kick this first guest off of the live podcast. Please welcome my very first guest, model, actress, writer, and comedian, Rosie Tran. <laughs> Hello, Rosie. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. We have, we have our beverage. Nice, actually. <laughs> Got to make sure our faces are properly lubricated for this entire podcast. Like, honestly, do you understand how anxious and uncomfortable I'm going to be every time I take a drink in front of a whole group of people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like, usually on my podcast, I can, it's audio only, so no one can see me do this. between every question. So everyone here, you're now going to get the inside scoop, the behind the scenes of me uh, drinking water like a hamster that has never had water ever in their Guys, time. Guys, that was a full act out right there. That was commitment. <laughs> act out with props. With props. I know. Carrot top, <laughs> eat your heart out. So Rosie, by the way, how was your, your flight here from, from LA? Did you fly or did you drive? It was wonderful. I flew on Delta and I'm happily here. Good. Excellent. Glad we're here. All right. Now, you're returning home, basically, because you were, I don't know about born here, but you were raised here in New Orleans, I has, right? I was born and raised on the West Bank at the Edward Aber Hospital, which is now then a Navy hospital and now a defunct hospital. <laughs> I have never asked anybody about their city and they responded with the hospital they were born in. 
I love it. It's very, we're going to start at the beginning. It was a cold, it was a windy cold, day. Rainy night. <laughs> I was a month premature. <laughs> <laughs> were you really premature? I was, yeah. Does your mother remind you about that all the time? She doesn't, but she always says that I'm in a rush. So. <laughs> She's like, you're always in a rush, just like when you were born. <laughs> oh, I couldn't wait to get out. Um, speaking of your parents, uh, your parents are also involved in the arts just as like as you are or involved in entertainment because your father is a writer? My father's passed away. He was a writer. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. That wasn't in your bio. <laughs> <laughs> but you need to write more things about your dead dad on your my, website. My dad is dead. <laughs> She's a funny comedian. Her dad's dead. Um, <laughs> basically, we just get, wrote the bio of Laurie Kilmartin right here. That's basically... <laughs> She has all two books about her dead parents now. Oh, okay. I do talk about my dead dad in my act now, so I'm starting to talk about that, but it's still fresh. But yes, he is dead, but he was a writer for many years, and then my mom is a former beauty pageant queen. Yeah, that's... Yeah. So, but it's... She's a mi winner of Miss Saigon. Miss Saigon, correct. She was the original Miss Saigon, not the play. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot there was a play. There Miss is Saigon. a play. She was actually Miss Saigon, as in a beauty pageant. And it's so funny. Wait, is the play about her? It's not about her. But the funny thing is, is that um, my mom always tells this story about how she escaped Vietnam, and she was on this boat, and she starved to death almost, and she was 90 pounds when she got here, and she only came here with the, the clothes off her back. Yet she still has her Miss Saigon trophy. <laughs> So I'm like, where did you hide that on the boat, Mom? She's like, I need evidence. I was hot once, America. I'm like, I'm, I'm actually being serious with it. There's this giant trophy, and my sister is actually a pretty established author. She wrote a book about our family called Daughters of the New Year, which is out right now with, I think it's Harper Collins. And um, they're going to be doing a Vietnamese American art exhibition in New Orleans that's being curated. And I think it's for two. 2025 and my mom's trophy will be in the art exhi exhibition. I hope she's <laughs> I hope she's cleaned the trophy since then. It's yeah, so it's it's still there, it's sitting there, but it's it's her one thing. So we always tease her. I love uh, just the picturing of your mom in a full ball gown with a tiara on, just <laughs> on some big boat escaping Vietnam, where she's just waving <laughs> all queens out like goodbye. very dramatic yeah it's very dramatic <laughs> so we don't know how she got the trophy here and the funny thing is I always ask her I'm like mom if you were on the boat and you only had what you could carry with you how did the trophy get here and she never tells me <laughs> well I, I hid it in a baguette because it, it was a, sandwiches. it's a very large trophy by the way it's not like a little trophy it's like this big and it's like it's like bigger than half of her body she's a very petite woman <laughs> so. oh my god I, I do you so let's talk about, do you believe your mom escaped in the, the, the way that she tells it, or do you think it's she's playing it up? What do you think? I, I, I do believe it. I think I just literally asked, can you tell me if you think your mom's a liar? That's what it is. <laughs> You're like, how bad did she suffer? Um, I actually think she had a very, um, it was a very rough uh, exit, because I think she was like one of the last people out of Vietnam for the fall of Saigon. I think she possibly bribed a relative or someone to send it over, but for some reason she doesn't want to tell the story. But I think that's what happened because it doesn't make any logical sense that this <laughs> giant trophy would go with her on this like ship where she was like you know in the bow of a ship with like rats and stuff. So, well, all right. Since your mother was a, a beauty queen, uh, does that did that influence you to go into modeling? It did not. I actually was really insecure growing up. I grew up in New Orleans, and I never experienced any racism or anything growing up here. <laughs> no, I'm not being sarcastic. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not being sarcastic. There's a huge Vietnamese community here, and I always felt like I belonged. I actually felt weirdly like I over-belonged, because... Things became very segregated in middle school. The black kids kind of only hung out with the black kids and the white kids only hung out with the white kids. But I was like this like middle person. So I could kind of move back and forth. Between. Oh, you were the day walker of the racism. <laughs> <laughs> of it, like, oh, she can hang with the whites and the and the. Yeah, cars. I'm like, I can be a minority or I can be white. Like, they're not sure. <laughs> So, and then there was also like a large Vietnamese population. So I never experienced any racism. I never felt out of place at all. But um, I was teased very heavily by my family. Um, Asian culture can be very, very racist. Um, stop Asian hate, <laughs> I'm talking about my parents. Um, and they, they, there's a lot of colorism in Asian culture, so I was very, very dark growing up, and people would um, 
you know, make fun of me and be like, you're so dark, you're, so, you're too dark, you're, you're, you know. And then also um, in, in Vietnamese culture, um, they're very superstitious. So they believe that if a child is really good, you want to insult them. This is true. Because, so that the bad spirits don't know. So them. now I feel like that I grew up in the Vietnamese <laughs> household. Yes, yeah, so I was basically heckled by my family um, from a young age. But yeah, they, they believe that if the child is very good, you want to scare the bad spirits away and don't let them know that the child is good, so you insult them. Um, but my parents didn't tell me this until I was an adult. <laughs> Well, how do you explain that? Like, look, we're going to be really mean to you, but no, it's because we want you to succeed. It's because we think you're awesome and we don't want the evil spirits to get you. Exactly. So um, I had very, very low self-esteem. I was very, and by very the way, what a better city to have, like, the belief of spirits and ghosts <laughs> other than New Orleans. Like, honestly, there's a the perfect place for a superstitious the, Vietnamese family. It's the perfect place, exactly. But, yeah, so I didn't, that didn't, um... I didn't feel like I was like this hot model person growing up. I was very insecure. And I started modeling very late, like in my late 20s, which is very late for a model. Usually people start like in their teenage years. You think, and I, see, that's the thing. I know nothing about modeling because I look like this. Like I am very like, look, trust me. I know. Look, I get it. I'm, I'm short. I'm fat. I have glasses. I'm bald. That's four strikes. And there's only three strikes in life. All right. I'm literally everything that we tell everyone it is okay to make fun of. Like, oh, short people? Yeah, make fun of them. Glasses, four eyes all day long, right? Bald, every person we hate is bald and impotent, right? Like, like if there's somebody who we hate and they're bald, they're like, ha ha, you deserve it. I am all of these things. I'm never going to be understanding the world of modeling. I'm never going to understand like, the, the, the being... Like, I, I can't understand... I, like, I can't wrap my head around the ability, and if this is not your experience, I apologize, is the... Never being able to trust anyone because are they being nice to you because they're nice or are they being nice to you because of the fears of being conventionally attractive. Because we as a society naturally gravitate towards conventionally attractive people, both female, male, everything in the middle. Like what, what we, as, you know, asymmetry or symmetrical faces, per, you know, height, like trust me, everyone here is nicer to someone that is taller than them. It's a thousand percent true. Think about it, the next time you see somebody tall and think about how nice you just start talking to them, all right? And then look at me short guys like get out of the way five foot six okay like there's a whole thread dedicated to everything on tinder hating everything about me but like i don't know if i could ever like it's the same thing in comedy like if you book a show and someone's being nice to you are they being nice because you're a funny comic or because they want to get on your show well, that's the only thing i can even empathize with and i don't know if that's ever been a concern or worry for you growing up well i would say that everything in life so i actually think everyone's equal and it's not because i'm one of these like oh everyone's equal kumbaya i believe everyone's <laughs> equal because there's something in life called trade-offs and everyone has a trade-off so um maybe someone would say oh well you know you're a model you're attractive that's a positive but there's also a negative so there's a negative and a positive to everything in life you know that everyone has depending if you're male female tall short whatever everyone has a trade-off in life there's some positives and some negatives and so i've gotten an insane amount of hate for being attractive yeah. and performing and that's a, had, that is the other side of the coin there are some who was like uh, basically what i just was admitted to being right now is like oh i hate you because you're pretty and i'm not <laughs> That's basically, like, I just showed all of my guards. Uh, I, I did a show at the comedy store, and there was, um, and this guy came straight up to me, and he was like, "Are you a comic?" And I was like, "Yes, I am." And he's like, "Oh, you don't look like you'd be very funny." And I was like, "Oh, okay." I said, "Well, what does a funny person look like to you?" And he pointed to um, someone that he thought looked funny. I'm not going to describe this person. Uh, I'm not, I'm not insulting. <laughs> he insulted two people at the same time. That is an economy of insults. So I'm not going to insult this person because they're a very nice person, but they they were someone that, in his mind, looked funny. It's Emo Phillips. <laughs> and the person, and we went on the show, and the person went up, and unfortunately they weren't that funny, and I was funny. And after the show, he came up to me, and he just kind of was like, oh, sorry. But I mean, so there's definitely stereotypes. You know, I did a show one time at the Laugh Factory, and there was all these beautiful women sitting in the front, much more beautiful than I was, but they were very uncomfortable with, like, an attractive fo woman on stage. And I, I've never felt so much hate in my life. I went on stage, and I was like, hey, guys. And I just felt like they were just staring me down. And I had a friend of mine who, um, rest in peace, Siddiqui Fuller, a hilarious comedian who passed away. And he pulled me aside, and he said, 
you need to be careful. He goes, look at that. Who's that? He pointed to a picture of Sarah Silverman, and he's like, she's beautiful. He goes, look how she's dressed. She has a hoodie on. She's dressed out. Look at her. Look at. She's a beautiful comedian. Look how she's dressed out hoodie. And so he was basically telling me, if I want respect, then I have to hide who I am. And so that's a trade-off. Yeah, and especially when you're talking about comedy, where we're literally bearing who we are. Like, if you don't laugh at our jokes, it's because you don't like us and our brains. I don't know how true that is, but... No one has ever said, oh my God, that guy's an asshole, but he's super funny. <laughs> like, f funny is directly related to how much you like a person. And if you're not gonna like a person, you're never gonna think them funny. So intrinsically, our comedy and your reaction to comedy is tied to us personally. I have similar things like I had to, in my early career of comedy. Because yeah, I just talked about all my negative things, but like literally, I am a big personality. You feel me coming into a room. Right, I have a, I'm a lot of person. I take up space on stage. If, even though I'm five foot six, I take up space. Like I'm a presence. And that is off-putting to some people. Yeah. Also, like I said, I have to open up jokes about how I look like I give unsolicited speeches on why we should keep <laughs> Confederate monuments. <laughs> Just to ease certain people's uncomfortableness about my own looks. And I, I assume it has to be similar when you're someone who's conventionally attractive as, as well. There is that, that concern but that's, sometimes. That's but everyone. Yeah. You know, I have a friend, Leo, who's a black male comedian, and he, he's clean. All of his comedy is clean. But he says when he goes on stage, he, he, he feels like people want him to be like, yo, 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 what's up? You know, like the hip hop, you know, start talking about rap or whatever. He's like, that's not me. He's a vegan. You know, he's very. <laughs> and that's the funny thing about a stand up is that he, his comedy doesn't match how he looks. But he gets a lot of discrimination because he'll go to go on shows and people will think he's going to be, you know, an urban comic. And he mm -hmm. goes up there and talks about being, you know, a vegan and doing yoga and all this stuff. And, and it, it takes people off guard. But the awesome thing is that we get to break stereotypes. Yes. You know, I have people come up to me all the time. Oh, I'm so surprised that you went up there and you were talking. You look really submissive. I'm like, really? That's weird. Ooh, like, where that's... did you get that from? You know? <laughs> hey, you look like a concubine. Can you talk more about that? Like... I've actually well, had, your feet are so big now. <laughs> I've actually had many, many people say that to me after the show. It's usually a guy, but I'll be like, "Oh, I, I'm so shocked. You seem like you'd be really submissive." I'm like, "Hmm, where'd you get that from, buddy?" <laughs> you know, because everyone that knows me knows I'm very loud and obnoxious. So obviously, <laughs> it's based on some stereotype that he has in his mind. And so, I, you know, when I, I have done a lot of panels with like other Asian Americans, and they're like, "Well, we need to stop this racism, or we need to stop these, you know, stop Asian hate, or stop these stereotypes." And I'm like. You can just stop it. You don't have to go out and protest or do whatever. You stop it by being yourself and being like, hey, I don't fit that stereotype. And then in people's mind, they're like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe all Asians aren't blah, blah, blah. Or maybe all black guys aren't blah, blah, blah. And so you just do it by being authentically yourself. Yeah, and that's... Was there a point where you had to learn how to be authentically you on stage? Because <laughs> some people, they hide who they are yes. when they come out. And they tell jokes. And the audience is instinctively know when you're being guarded. Is that something you felt you had to learn or was that something that you always knew about your personality? Um, so I got really, really lucky. I don't know if I ever told you my stand-up origin story. So um, I got into stand-up by accident. Um, I was dating. He tripped, fell, <laughs> grabbed the microphone, was like, whoa, banana peels, what? <laughs> no, I was dating a guy who wanted to be a comedian and I hated stand-up. Oh, I, I love, I'm already in love with the story. <laughs> Wait, I want to skip ahead. I want to skip ahead, but I'll let you tell the story. Go ahead, go ahead. So please. I thought comics were obnoxious. I was like, what is the point of this? This is boring. I hate this. And I would sit in the back and judge everyone. I was like the girlfriend with her arms crossed. And then I would, I think I had a comic mind, but I didn't realize it. And I would be like, babe, why don't you tell the joke like this? And he would tell it the way I told him and he'd get a laugh. And I'd be like, well, why don't you tell the joke like this instead? And he would tell it the way I told him and he'd get a laugh. And so... He was like, well, why don't, he's like, if you're, you know, you're so funny, why don't you write five minutes? And I'm like, no, no, I'm not a comic. Oh, <laughs> I love that. Oh, if you think you're so, why don't you go try this? Okay, here we go, everybody. <laughs> Netflix is a calling. Yeah, so I was really shy, and I was like, no, are you crazy? I, I would never be able to be a comedian. But Pause he, for one moment. Yes. At this time, have you been doing anything involved with entertainment or writing? No. or No. no. Okay. So I, all that stuff came after your introduction to the stand-up comedy? Correct, yeah. Okay, I, cool. I thought I was going to you know, do something behind the scenes. I was extremely shy, um, child, kid, whatever. Well, so, it's, it's a lateral, like comedy, writing, acting, they're all lateral moves. 
Yeah. Uh, like if you're, somebody's gonna hate me for saying this, but, uh, and somebody just hates me in general. There's a lot of, <laughs> I'll give you a list after the show of those people, but. Comedy moving into acting is not that different because we're kind of already performing in front of you already, you know? Uh, you, just, you have to learn to have the, lose your inhibitions. Comedy is writing, all right? Yes. It's performing and it's writing. Like, if you understand the process of creating entertainment, if you understand the structure of writing and stories, naturally you're gonna move into the stand-up comedy. Like, not naturally move into it, but there is a lateral it's movement easier, to that. Yeah. So, the fact that you didn't have any of those things is very interesting uh, to tell. Yeah, so, so I yes. didn't have any comedy experience. I hated stand-up. I had never watched a stand-up comedian a day in my life. I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. And so, um, basically, I, he, he planted the seed when he said, well, why don't you write five, ten minutes in if you're so funny? And then after we broke up, it had been being written, I think, by my subconscious mind. <laughs> and, I was, and I kind of missed going to the open mics, actually. I was like, oh, I kind of miss going to open mics without him, even though we were together. Because I was always... He was oh, my always God, he dragged to you to open mics. He would drag me to open mics. Uh, <laughs> as a comedian, I... Uh, uh, the, 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 everyone in the room was like, uh, uh, we all just groaned. It's, but, uh, actually, uh, so back around to your original question... Is he still doing comedy? He's not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, back to your original question about finding my voice. So most comedians take 10 years to find their authentic voice. I was actually really lucky because I was so blind to stand-up comedy. I had never really watched any comedians that I developed a voice naturally because I was just like, oh, what's funny to me? And that, that was a, an insane gift because most people... They're very derivative, so if you're a Dane Cook fan, your stand-up's a little Dane Cookish. ish yeah. right? I think everybody starts out a little bit like somebody else. Like, there was definitely, like, I definitely had my, my, uh, the, uh... Dane Cook's from Boston? Yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm not from, I live in Boston. I'm not from there. But no, I like, like the, the, the shouting, like, um... I Sam, just literally Sam, Sam Kennison, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I had my Sam Kennison years. I've yeah. definitely uh, locally but that's I've done, yeah. You, like you, you del I've had my Dennis Leary deliveries <laughs> and stuff like that. You know, we're both Dennis's. It had nothing to do with Boston. All right. Anyway, I've never met him. Please, Dennis Leary, if you're listening to the podcast, please come on. <laughs> Want to talk about? All okay. Anyway, sorry. So yeah, so I I didn't have that, and in fact, I had never watched any comedians. And when I started doing stand up, comics would be like. You've never seen Eddie Murphy Raw. You've never seen this. You've never seen that. You've never seen this. You've never heard of Richard Pryor. And so I went back and watched them, and it was so hard for me because those are all renegades of stand-up in the 80s, but now their material sounds like dinosaur material. Right. Like you go back and watch it, and you're like, ooh, that's super racist. You're like, ooh, that's really... You know, I mean, other than George Carlin, everyone's material has aged very poorly. <laughs> and so I watched the stand-up and I was like, oh, this is terrible. And so I wasn't able to look up to the traditional stand-ups. You know, most people watch Johnny Carson or they watch Richard Pryor and they're like, oh, that's what I want to be like when they're younger. But I was watching it in hindsight and I was like, this is terrible. Because Richard Pryor has been copied by so many comics that he mm -hmm. seemed himself unoriginal when I went back to go look at him, even though he's the source of it. He's the original Richard Pryor, right? Yeah. But I'm you know, in the 2000s, and I've seen all these comics copy Richard Pryor, and so Richard Pryor himself, as someone who was not a stand-up fan, looking back, I was like, oh, this is kind of hacky, even though obviously he's the originator <laughs> of the material, right? And so um, that was the only thing that was good about it. But I, I, what I did notice is that a lot of relationship material about relationships in general stood the test of time. Caroline Ray, I saw her 90s special. It's still oh, translated. Joan great. Rivers translated. Mm -hmm. You know, so anyone who had relationship material, but anyone who was a character comedian, you know, Tim the Tool Man Taylor, or like, you know, hey, I'm Jim Carrey and I'm wacky. <laughs> it was terrible. I mean, I'm pretty sure that was it. on his business cards. Jim Carrey, <laughs> I am wacky. Here, five, 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 five. Jim Carrey is a genius, but go back and watch old Jim Carrey. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's him doing the Ace Ventura character. It's him going like, hey, I'm Jim Carrey. Oh, look at my arm. And you're like, oh, what is this? You're like, what the hell is happening? The only people who stand the test of time are people that talk about relationships. George Carlin, experiences, universal themes. But anyone who is like, even Roseanne. Roseanne, I think, translates a little bit because she talks about being a mom. But a lot of the older stand-up is very, very dated and is aged very poorly. So, I, I was lucky that I was in a stand-up comedy fan. <laughs> well, last question I'm going to ask you before we introduce our next guest, I think is an interesting question, and obviously I think the goal of 
anyone is in, in art is just to be treated as an entertainer, not by your gender, but not by your race and other those things. But unfortunately, there's a question I have to ask that it only applies to women. That question is, uh, did you have any, growing up, female comedian icons? Because I've talked to other comedians who are like, I've never saw a female comedian until I started doing comedy. But me, growing up, Lucille Ball, Gilda Radner, like the, Joan Rivers. I grew up with them. Like I literally got into fights in the playground going, Joan Rivers is funny and women are funny. Because to me growing up, I noticed that because comedy was everything to me growing up. I grew up after that puzzle, that, that bubble. But you, somebody who wasn't exposed to comedy, was there anybody before you started doing comedy that you could identify with comedy-wise as a, as a female performer growing up? Because I've known a lot of comedian, female comedians, women comedians who identify as women and just say, uh, all my comedy icons are men. So actually, none of my comedy icons are men, and it's not a sexist or feminist thing. Um, what I said was true, is that the material that stood the test of time after 20, 30 years was the relational material, and the relational material happened to be mostly female. Joan Rivers, if you go back and watch her set from 50 years ago, it's still funny. Um, my only uh, male stand-up icon is George Carlin, just because some of his stuff is so, I mean, you're like, are you still talking? It's actually sad how relevant George Carlin is because it's like, we're still dealing with this shit. Like, <laughs> it was funny in the 70s and it's still funny now. That's not a good thing. Like, we shouldn't be able to laugh at the same problems from 40 years ago. <laughs> so um, he is really my only uh, male icon, but, but you know, Joan Rivers is great. She was really my icon watching her, watching her, you know, do material on Ed Sullivan and other things like that where, you know, people said she was disgusting because she was talking about um, dating and she wasn't married yeah. and things like that at the time. So in the 60s. So um, she's one of my favorites. And I I didn't feel a lack of uh, female comics. Margaret Cho obviously was one of my, my absolute favorites. Um, I, di I didn't feel that way, no. But I wish there were more. I'm going to show my here, and I love Margaret Cho. I think Cho, she's a fantastic, hilarious comedian, one of the best. Her, a what is her Asian background, ethnicity? She's Korean. Korean, that's what I thought. I didn't want to be like, she's Korean. I was like, no, she's, and then you have to correct me. <laughs> so I figured it was like, let me just bare my soul and just throw myself on everybody. I'm like, and she is, okay. But is there a relatability between Korean and Vietnamese? There's some similarities just because right. it's Eastern culture and, and similar immigrant experience. Yeah, and I feel like immigrant culture across the board is very similar. Like, I, I'm more familiar with growing up in Baltimore and having people who immigrate here from Italy, Greek, or, you know, to this country from mostly Europe. And I hear a lot of their families talking about, you know, my family, you know, plastic furniture, or they want me to grow up to do this, or having to translate for my father at the grocery store, stuff like that. Sounds very relatable across different ethnicities. Yeah. Um, that wasn't a question that was most me to say, and I'm sorry, but you can no, respond no. to it, I don't know. Well, to go back to what you said, a lot of th people don't understand too, there's a lot of female comedians and there always have been. Just because someone didn't get famous doesn't mean they don't exist. If you go to the top comedy clubs in the country, go look on the wall. Yeah, there's a lot of guys, but there's also a lot of women there. There's a lot of women. There's a Japanese comedian that was big at the comedy store in the 80s. She just never made it. You know, the, just because someone didn't get famous doesn't mean that they weren't out there blazing the trail. When you walk on a trail and it's completely worn down, it's not just worn down from people's you know, big feet. They're, like, little feet come and walk on it too, and doggies <laughs> come on and walk on it too, and it makes that path. And so there's thousands of female comedians out there, hilarious female comedians that blaze that path for us that maybe they didn't get famous or maybe they had a kid. I mean, that's the heartbreaking thing is a lot of times someone will have a kid and then they'll, they'll leave or their husband will, will make them quit stand up or whatever, they'll wanna be with the kid. And so that's, that's the difference. You know, whereas if you're a guy, it's easier to go on the road and leave because people are just used to that. But go to any comedy club in the country that has all the headshots and look at some of the old ones and there's dozens of, of hilarious female comedians. They just, some of them didn't make it. All right, well, thank you so much, Rosie, for opening up your experience about work and stuff like that. Keep that applause going. We're going to introduce our second guest for the show. She is a writer, she is a podcaster, and a comedian. Put your hands together for Meryl Como. She came from over here. Watch your step. Step on up. Come on up. I'm narrating her path for people who are listening. She's walking in different directions. Hello, Meryl. Sit down. Welcome. So good, I got goosebumps, and now my stuff is gonna be like, I write shit. 
<laughs> that was so inspiring. That was so good. And Rosie and I are actually like real life friends too. So. <laughs> uh, I, I love that I've uh, done everything in my entire life just to make women cry. That's basically <laughs> this whole show was just another reason to make another woman cry. A lot of life. bald, so, impotent men have yes. made me cry in my life. It's okay. Oh, uh, I have a list of those too. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So for I want all right. I, again, have to show my ignorance. I'm throwing myself upon you guys to just be like, I don't know things, please tell me what they are. Uh, you're a writer and s more specifically, a lifestyle contributor to LA Girl Magazine. Yeah. Which means, by the way, she lives in LA, everybody. Yeah, very okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, as well, I'm sure we'll get into it, but that is one of the things that I do. What is a lifestyle contributor? Oh I God. do not, like, I don't understand shopping. Like, I go to places, I buy what I need, and, and I go home. But here's all at the same time, there's, like, no men's clothing stores where you can go, like, window shopping. Like, I was in Texas a couple weeks ago, and I was just, like, I looked at a store that was, like, a boutique store of women's clothing. I was like, I just want a place where I could just go window shop for handkerchiefs. <laughs> And belts. Like, why can't I? Like, I, I look like a creep walking around a women's boutique shop. Like, no matter what uh, appearance my face has walking in, uh, to everyone else in a women's boutique shop, when I walk around, it just looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to start, like, the adversarial, like the Boston boy. You'll have to, you'll have to respond to the LA girl. No, like, yeah, that's basically all it's going to be is the same cap that I've been wearing for 30 years yeah. and uh, Red Sox jerseys. That's all the entire. That's just like, all we give tours on duck boats. The duck boy. <laughs> Boston boy. Um, yeah, so. LA Girl is a lifestyle publication. Uh, it, one of my friends uh, happened to purchase it from, it was already an established brand, and one of my good friends, a wonderful woman, Erica De La Cruz, got it, and then it was just acquired by another company called Penske Media. So basically, like, it's, we're expanding out more, but it's a lifestyle publication that covers fashion, food, travel, all the LA stuff. But it's funny you should say that, because I'm, I'm the one person on the staff that doesn't care about fashion at all. <laughs> So like we can tell by your all black outfit. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't care about fashion, but my, I like to put my fanny pack away. But like you're wearing a black outfit, but also not dressed black enough to wear like you're a goth girl. No, like, I'm not a goth girl. <laughs> like you're just wearing black, and that's really like at best theater stage manager. Oh god, like theater, not even a, not even like an understudy. I got stage manager. Cool. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, so my job, you know, it will range a lot of covering restaurants. Um, they send me to all like the weird quirky stuff. So I just went to Wisconsin for a trip, you know, a travel trip. And so the stuff that like it's not fashion week, but the people that uh, don't really want to do it is what I get. Mac and cheese <laughs> festivals, um, you know, all the weird quirky stuff. But I'm very happy to have I that mean, thing. That's what I asked because I'm, I'm curious about other people getting writing because I told everybody here, I grew up in radio. The reason why I went into the radio industry is because it, it blended my two loves growing up, music and comedy. When I was a radio jock, every time I opened the microphone, I was gonna say one of two things, something informative, either about the band, about the news or something, or a joke. That was my goal. Write a joke, say something interesting, right? There was no just, and here's this next song, or just like bland. Everything had to be, uh, it like, Hi, the next song you're listening to is Rise Against. Their lead singer has heterochromia, which means he has one blue eye and one green eye. Here's their new song, Swing Life Away. Like, I wanted to say something really cool and interesting or make a joke. And so that led me into writing. Like, I write for a newspaper, right? Which, by the way, I worked in radio. I write for a newspaper. I am the king of all dead media. <laughs> like, if I ever have a comedy special, it's going to come out on Betamax. <laughs> I, hear, I, I did radio for a year in San yeah. Diego, and I always heard, like, you get these cool trips to Hawaii and everything, and all we got was, uh, there was a prize wheel, and it was just old Seinfeld DVDs. <laughs> and I'm like, if you've never seen grown men fight over a Seinfeld DVD, you have not lived life. But yeah, I hear you. Radio the only thing like, I got out of uh, radio was a poster of uh, One Night at McCool's was the first movie that I owned on DVD. Anyway, <laughs> did were you always, so I got into writing because I was already doing interviews audibly, and my writing for this newspaper was they asked me to come join them as their comedy interview writer. I would do interviews with, by the way, I was, you don't want to know a secret, I was totally stealing from this newspaper. What I would do is I would record an interview over the phone with my friend comedians. I would then have AI transcribe it. I would then give it to my boss. He would then spell check all of it, and then they would mail me a check. Like it was the best job I've ever had. Anyway, I got into writing by chance. I'm not a writer. 
Like, I, I, that's why somebody else has to prove my work because I'm, my writing's terrible. Did you get into writing because you were in similar lateral moves or were you always a fan of writing growing up? Um, I think growing up, I just spent a lot of time alone at the computer. <laughs> it, it was in between playing Space Invaders by myself. I just learned to write, or you know, I really definitely have, uh, as I'm sure a lot of us do in the arts. You know, like I like to process things through writing, and I feel like a lot of times that's how things can come out first, and then performing them usually comes like sixth or seventh or something. But um, no, I mean the LA Girl thing came about. I write in many different things. The LA Girl one is a good example of uh, my friend had gotten into it and purchased it and she helped me and saw my vision and it was like I feel like it's an example of uh, having friends around you that really want to lift you up and who see your highest vision isn't and so she has been this, once again her name is Erica and uh, she is someone that has always like plucked me along and whether or not I think I'm ready she always pushes me and was like okay you're going to be a you're going to do interviews you're going to be a travel journalist you're going to go to these restaurants and I just kind of grew into that and I think like that's an example of having someone that is doing huge things that is helping you kind of do bigger things, you know. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And real quick editing note, Rosie, if you're going to all her stories, do it on microphone, please. That's <laughs> I think that my mic's okay. It wasn't working earlier. <laughs> no, she's sitting behind her the entire room. <gasps> After so sweet. Sweet. And I'm like, we need this for the emotions that the people are going to feel on the audience. We'll just have to do like 10 aw takes oh, after. Yeah, just Rosie, like, you have five podcasts, six podcasts. Talk on mic. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't want to talk over you. Oh, okay. So, oh, oh, yeah, this is, it's all about like female empowerment. We're just, it's like two hours of us just like, oh. <laughs> Honestly, this is just ASMRM of women feeling more confident <laughs> to other women. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, you're also an LA comic. We established that, but you're not. You're also like Rosie, where you're an LA transplant. Correct. You know, not born and raised there. You're from from Scranton, Pennsylvania. Scranton, which, PA, home of the office. The office. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, like all right. The office is fine. All right. I'm and everything gonna, how they portray it is exactly Scranton. Like it uh, really is truly I'm the, Scranton. I'm sure it is. I don't. I, I've never really. The show's fine. It's funny. I just don't want to watch it. That's like. I. I like. If the, I, this is the thing. Here's my problem with The Office, and it's probably not the problem with The Office, it's the problem with me, is that the amount of Tinder bios that I've read was like, most interesting thing about me is like I quote every episode of The Office. is like, you're not interesting, so I <laughs> Wait, you want to hear something interesting? I was crowned the nerdiest guy in jail because of my extensive knowledge of the Star Wars holiday special. <laughs> Yeah, that's much more interesting than the office. Nobody even knows what I just said. But it also does not make it into my Tinder bio. So, actually it is. Anyway. Are you swiping while you're here? <laughs> can I run your Tinder for you? We'll talk after. Oh, done. No, you 100% can take control of my Tinder. Really? Okay. Trust that's me. Exciting. There is nothing you can write that can overcome the photos of this goblin <laughs> troll that I am. Okay? Even my cute dog. By the way, you guys want to see pictures of my cute dog? Yes. Right? We're, we're going to do pictures of my dog. Anyway. Yes. Uh, no, you're beautiful. You also just look like someone that would be in the game Clue. Have you heard that a lot? Like, you absolutely look like a Clue character. But like in yeah, a murderer. I look like a murderer is what you said. No, no, no. Every game of Clue, if I was a character, ends with Dead Air Dennis. Somewhere with something. Yes, you win. Yay. We have female empowerment going over there and like the depths of self-deprecation going over <laughs> on this side of the table. So what I was going to ask you is because you're from Scranton, Pennsylvania, you went to Syracuse because apparently there was not enough snow for you in Scranton. And then you end up in LA. Why did we go to, to what was it about Syracuse uh, College that attracted you? Because the reason I went to the, I went to six years of community college and didn't graduate. And the reason I went to that college is because they had a, a, a wrestling team and civil engineering. And then the day I went to register, I quit both and picked TV and radio production. <laughs> like I went the six years and finished three degrees that I never got because I didn't pay for my last semester. But I went for TV and radio and that was the, the little change of my entire life, right? Was that moment at college, going to Montgomery College in Rockville, Maryland, where I went, you know what? I did theater in high school. Running a camera is a lot like running a spotlight. Let me take this path. And that was a complete change in my life. Was Syracuse setting you up for the path of your life, or why did we choose Syracuse? Uh, okay. A very long <laughs> way of saying, why did you choose? <laughs> Here's so much about me, Mom. You talk about you. Path of my, I, meanwhile, I'm like scrolling your Tinder. I'm like, you're meeting up with this girl at 5 p.m. Just show up. Um, uh, oh, please send me up with a woman with a hardcore Cajun accent, because I'm sure it sounds better than a Boston accent. Like, every woman with a Boston accent, she's like, ah, fuck me, honey, you fucking queer. Ah, let's do this, kid. 
it's fucking nauseating. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, so the reason I chose Syracuse was because my parents went there and they took me. <laughs> that's the truth. Is that eventually met in Syracuse? It's very. I was probably conceived somewhere deep. Oh, in your the parents were setting up your own life of, meet cute. Yeah, exactly. And so they they tricked me. They took me uh, to tour Syracuse on a, in April, and you know everyone was outside playing frisbee and it looked really fun and I got sold on it. And then Syracuse is like very 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 cold. It's a uh, hundred. 14 inches of snow a year. Yeah, yeah. I looked it up. I do work. I do a lot of prep for my interviews. Suck it. Anyway. Yeah. So I was. I did not know. You know, I'm from the East Coast. I'm used to obviously cold weather, but this was a whole different ball game of the sun not being out for weeks. And I think <laughs> when you talk about life path, like uh, not in the greatest way. Where it was the first time I really did start having some panic attacks, and I, I probably wasn't like I didn't know anything about mental health at that point or physical health, and so I think. Don't like, hold back. I am a huge proponent for mental illness. Talk. No, wait. Sorry, I didn't mean that. I meant mental health. I meant, it would have been weird if what the next thing I was like, everyone should have depression. I'm sorry. Right. No, please open up about your, your, I am a huge proponent for mental health and stuff like that. Please don't. Have, yeah, oh, yeah. That's what we'll talk about. Like, if, if you had seasonal, uh, pre, uh, sad, seasonal affective disorder, SAD, basically. Yeah. It was, and there was just the same season for like eight months. So it was just a, <laughs> a lot of SAD. And so, uh, but yeah. And, and, literally affective. Literally affective. Yeah. I don't know why I'm like reading the next question. Sorry. But uh, <laughs> what if I, I'm she's like, doing prep to her own answers right now while looking at my notes. I'm, I'm keeping, keeping it moving. But, um, Syracuse, uh, they have, you know, their their communications school is great. I did go there for that, and uh, I majored in public relations, and then I minored in music industry, because at that time, my dream was to work at a music venue. I was, like, very focused nice. on that, and then I went, I got a job after graduating in San Diego at a music venue, um, and then that was, like, awesome. Then I feel like life began. So. Can, what Can I ask what year around this was that you were graduating? Sure, I graduated in 2004. 2004. So there's still kind of early days of the internet. Like, how does one navigate trying to find a job across country with the fledgings of the internet in an industry that you have no experience oh, in? That's, I'm, I feel like I'm always so geeky in everything I do that I came to, Sar or I came to San Diego with like a binder and I had I had studied everyone's name. So the, I was going to these like cool music joints, like kind of ones like this, and I had this trapper keeper and I would look up and be like, there's this legendary venue called the Casbah and I remember like... Oh, yeah, I've heard about the rock, rock there. Yeah, well, it's made. Uh, 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 but the the owner there is like this very. That was a Clash reference, and that deserved better from all of you. Okay. Yeah, I, I remember meeting the guy who's tattooed and like has he you know was one of the people that put Pearl Jam on the map and all this kind of stuff. And I just remember flipping to page seven and being like, I would love to be hired by this establishment. And so, uh, and that's uh, the music. I don't really have like a profile on all these people. Like either you're stalking them or you're very effective at finding a job. I was obsessed, and I felt like I was so geeky, and then I ended up getting a job at a very wonderful music venue in San Diego called The Belly Up, um, and I worked there for 11 years. But at the interview, they did, they could have cared less that I went to Syracuse. They didn't care about like education or anything. They were just like, this reggae artist needs to get his Oreos, so can you do that? <laughs> and so that was, that was that. And then, so... By the way, we're going to talk so much about dogs later on because she oh, also nice. used to work at the uh, L.A. Animal Services, Aww. which uh, I know, like, uh, my 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 dog, who is named Sister, who you're all going to see pictures of later. In fact, I would have been showing you pictures right now, but apparently somebody attacked from the projector, so there was no projector. Anyway, uh, that, that she was, uh, I hate this word rescue, ugh. Uh, but she was found on the side of the highway with a litter of pups, uh, and and so I'm uh, like I she's a failed foster as I like to call her. She was my <laughs> pandemic puppy, and I was just like when they called, they're like, hey, we're gonna start introduce her to other families. I was like, you can have her back when you call prior from my cold dead hands. Like that was the last call with the Paul's New England uh, about my dog who is named Sister. So working with animals, but you worked with them doing PR. So was the LA Animal Services before San Diego or after? That was after. After, okay. Trying yeah. to get timelines here straight. Uh, what made you leave the music venue, which is, you're, you're a huge fan of music as, as, yeah. as, as well as I am. What made you leave that to go to LA to start doing PR for, <laughs> for 
Sarah McLaughlin videos. Yeah, I don't know why I take jobs. I, I also grew up with a mom in a good way who taught me it's just okay that when you're done with the job, you could just leave it. <laughs> and so oh, my dad's the exact opposite. Yeah, oh, exactly, I set a job's yeah. way too long. I'm very easily manipulated and abused at a job. I'm the perfect target for it, but go ahead. So at the music venue, I kind of, the same way that I was focused on on music industry, um, I started to see podcasting kind of as the next big thing that I really liked. I did a podcast at that music venue, and then I was like, okay, I'm going to follow this trail and get more into podcasting. So I got into podcasting in 2016. At that time, it was very part-time, so I needed something else to supplement that. Then came LA Animal Rescue, because I also love animals a lot, and I worked there for about a year, and then, um, yeah, just then became full-time in well, podcasting. What, what, what does one... PR, I think, is such a broad term that bugs me. <laughs> like every time I get a, 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 a an email from a PR person, I'm like, "Hey, would you? They're coming. This person's coming to Boston. Do you want to interview them?" I'm like, "Yes, I do, but not through you. Like, please stop emailing me and just let me talk to them personally. No offense to your, to your industry, but uh, what what are your what do PR people do? Like copywriting, I know is a very typical." skill set that they ask in PR mm -hmm. and I don't know what copywriting is like I, when you when you were were working for them and and PR and and someone who was a copywriter like how do you get from like to like I can do an interview with people I can write interview questions but if you want me to write like anything that's not an interview I have no how to do I can write jokes and interviews that's it but you as someone who's a professional writer what are the differences between these other disciplines of writing well, so normally the job would have been more media relations you know like getting an event published in the newspaper or on the news a lot of times we would take adoptable dogs and take them to the news and you know parade them around but we're like that's the easiest like here's cute call us yeah you want cute at home call us so we were dealing in LA home. and so in LA basically uh, you know one of my job is one day was that uh, we can edit this part out maybe but like Kendall Jenner's Doberman had bit someone <laughs> <laughs> We had one day Variety Magazine was calling to like More get the reasons for me to not like Kendall Jenner. So yeah, so our job was basically to run interference between Kendall Jenner's Doberman and Variety Magazine coming out with that article. <laughs> <laughs> so, allegedly, allegedly. Only in allegedly. LA could you be a spin doctor for celebrity dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And ours was very like City Hall. They would have this event with the mayor called Kitty Hall. So it, I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it, it's like a, it is a sitcom, which I think they made a sitcom. Which, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I feel like the LA version of stuff is really weird. But normally PR is like, you know, getting people's message in the hands of media. Yeah. <laughs> and also just trying to distract everyone from the scandalous performances of celebrity dogs. I love yeah. this. This is fantastic. Really? I just wanted to get pictures with dogs. And that's, that's <laughs> why I did the whole job for a year. Yeah, exactly, right? Uh, yeah, well, that's why I'm not allowed. That's why I had to keep my foster dog because I was banned from the dog place, for, from the dog walk park, from uh, just showing up without dogs. Like, can I just take pictures of your dogs? <laughs> we also learned to have can I, can I have a picture with Luna? I know I had a picture yesterday, but it's today. <laughs> They would have chicken holding classes for us at, uh, in LA because sometimes we, we'd get farm animals and so every <laughs> Tuesday, if you wanted to, you could volunteer to like learn how to hold a rooster correctly. <laughs> Once again, my education really coming in clutch. Uh, also, I'm not surprised in LA they have a class on how to hold a cock properly, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> waka, waka, waka. All right, so you brought up a good subject that I want to talk to you both about because you're both very experienced in the world of podcasts as we are now on a live podcast. <laughs> I'm gonna put in so much cheering uh, in post-production. <laughs> By the way, I just wanna point out, uh, in Boston, where uh, I, I, I don't sit at the right lunch table sometimes uh, when it comes to the Boston comedy community, and every comedy community has people that sit at the right and wrong lunch table, but it's very middle school as all of entertainment really is. But uh, there is a secret message group about me in the Boston comedy community, and one of the Boston messages, and I've been fortunate enough to have big name guests. Uh, sorry, watch your feet, I'm gonna drop, name drop Jim Jeffries. Uh, Lewis Black from The Daily Show, Jessica Kearson, Wayne Fetterman, a lot of really great comedians. I've been because I give good interviews. There's PR people that know that it's those good in-depth interviews, and they're also like he writes for a newspaper, and they're still uh, behind 20 years. But uh, that I've been accused <laughs> of taking interviews with celebrities, stealing someone else's interview, and injecting my own voice into it. <laughs> I love 
love, there's a small circle of people creating these conspiracy theories about me. Like, Here's the worst part about working in media for 20 years, as good of a media per per person that I am. And there's and a secret Facebook group about this? There's a secret Facebook message group that sometimes people will screen grab and send to me and let me know <laughs> It's that. not just you, it's not like Dennis 1, Dennis 2. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> so you pretend to me, yeah. I have these skills, but I don't have that kind of time okay. to sit down and do that. So that's why my body has switched the video so nobody can really accuse me of video editing experience. But, so you're both majorly experienced uh, podcasters now. Rosie, you have, like I said, 16 different podcasts and 42 different hosts of all of them. And you started a podcast in the early years of podcasting when it was really hard to start a podcast. So what was it that attracted you guys to podcasts? We'll start with Rosie first because you have a lot of podcasts that are like limited edition podcasts or like short series podcasts. Yeah. Where was the inspiration for a lot of, like you have a podcast where you, uh, with a former porn star, Tommy Pistol? He's a current porn star. Current star, okay, <laughs> all right. I'm glad the business is still working for him. Uh, uh, but uh, it, where you guys talk to people about their sexual inhibitions or their uncomfortabilities about growing up in a world was set, whatever you yeah. do a better job describing your podcast than I can. But what was the inspiration for a lot of these podcasts? Where it comes because it seems like they're very like we are on a specific subject for a short period of time. Uh, it's a limited series. We're talking about we're gonna get to the depths of it, and you're working with other people's orders. The inspiration for all the podcasts that you have done come from. So my first podcast, Out of the Box, which is still going on, and it's been going on for four or five years, maybe seven years, I don't know. <laughs> time is a work. Um, I started because I was very depressed in stand-up comedy, and I felt like my career wasn't going anywhere, and I was tired of people waiting for people to make things happen. So um, I started the podcast because I just wanted to interview people that I liked, and it's called Out of the Box because everyone is some type of non-mainstream person, and the only theme with Out of the Box is they have to have some type of positive message. And it was actually just for myself because I was depressed. And so that's uh, really helped me a lot. So every guest, and it's it's actually very annoying because a lot of my comedian friends will be like, well, I want to be on your podcast. I'm like, well, do you have something positive or inspiring to say? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, then you can't be on my podcast. <laughs> I have a similar thing when I talk about day jobs. And I'm like, do you have an interesting day job? I was like, yeah, I work at Starbucks. I'm like, that's not interesting. No. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's, that's it. And then every podcast I've had is just something that I was interested in talking about. The podcast you're talking about was over COVID. And it's me and adult film star Tommy Pistol. It's a sex education podcast called Dirty Change. And it was just a limited edition um, because of Tommy's schedule. And, and it's just, I felt like we were total opposites. I was very virginal growing up. I thought I was gonna you know, marry the first guy I had sex with. I grew up in a very conservative family and Tommy is Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't know anything about sex growing up. I didn't it's just weird that his legal given birth name was Pistol and he grew up to be a porn star. <laughs> it's like manifest destiny. <laughs> Yeah, that's a state name, but you know that. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I just thought, you know, I didn't know anything about sex growing up, and a lot of kids now are looking stuff up online and learning about sex through the adult film industry, and that's not realistic. That's a fantasy, and a lot of people don't know that that's a fantasy. And so, um, I'm going to be getting <laughs> a very unhealthy fantasy. Like I literally outside before the thing I had to find. I asked me, I was like. So is it like illegal to look at porn in LA? Because it wanted me to take a picture of, it, of my face to identify my age. I was like, that was, uh, apparently you, there's a law here where you have to show age verification to look at porn in Louisiana, which admitted in front of a whole group of people <laughs> in the street. I was like, so I was looking at porn at my death hotel earlier. Um, people are shaking their heads, so I'm not sure what you were doing, but <laughs> but yeah, so I just, I wanted to have the experience of someone that was very opposite of me and talking about sex education and talking about sex and things like that from an educational point of view and from a point of view of just trying to learn about it and in a fun way. So I'm the funny, he's the porn. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a lot of fun. And it was a six episode special series. We got featured in Hustler Magazine. And I learned so much about sex even as a, I'm almost 40 now, but as a 30 something year old woman, I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't know that either. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's really great. You guys should check it out. It's on YouTube. And then I have a crypto podcast because I'm interested in crypto. And I have a, um, a uh, political podcast because I'm interested in politics. And it's the same thing. It's a friend of mine who has a completely different political viewpoint as I am. And we were sick of all the divisiveness. And so we have completely opposite political viewpoints. And we talk about things that we have in common. And we talk about the issues, and it's also, a, I think it's a six-episode series, and we have 
talk about major issues from different points of view. I'm an independent and he's a socialist. And so we just talk about our points of view and we have a lot in common and we get along and we can talk about politics without screaming and ripping each other's heads off. So I just, all my podcasts are just things that I'm really passionate about and I don't know <laughs> if anyone listens to them, but. Well, I see that the, I don't do podcasts about, side podcasts about my interests because we don't need another white guy talking about comic books. That's basically <laughs> all the other interests I have. Like, I'm dying to finish this podcast and go home and rewatch season two of Loki. So, <laughs> but Meryl, you're, uh, you started early in podcasting. In the early years, I mean, you saw, you were for, fortuitous enough to see what the future of that was going. And you created a podcast for the, the, music venue you, you worked at, how was trying to sell people on what a podcast was and how it would be beneficial to their business in the early years of it? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was so fun doing the podcast at the music venue because we would have these legendary artists coming through every single night. And during that time between sound check and when the actual show happens, they would just be sitting in the dressing room, like not really. So I was able to sell the owners on basically it, it's part of the marketing budget. And like at that time, I was the marketing person. So I was just adding lines items and hoping they don't notice whenever we do our yearly <laughs> review. Um, and they knew too. Honestly, I was like, I need to do a podcast, otherwise I'm going to leave this job. And so I think <laughs> they, they helped me. But, but I, I, I was able I'm to... I'm going to leave yeah. if you don't let me record my voice. It was a non-negotiable. And so, but I was able to like, uh, I started podcasting with people. I said, so I interviewed like Mick Fleetwood and CeeLo and Jimmy Buffett and people that I had no business sitting Amazing. down with. Where it was super cool, but I feel like if I started today, I, I, I thought I was more name nervous. It, name dropping. <laughs> well, no, I mean, but basically to show, like, I, I threw myself into the deep yeah. waters, and then I think, like, even with comedy sometimes, it's like that beginner's confidence, and then now I'd be like, oh my god, I don't know what I'm doing. But that first year open mic, like, I know everything about comedy. I've done six open mics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> During my interview with Mick Fleetwood, uh, his publicist passed me a note that said, like, I could just read something, and it was like, don't mention the new album or something, and all I could see it was like, the new album. <laughs> I asked him about that. But uh, anyway, I, I felt like, yeah, I love podcasting. I like to help other people launch their podcast as well and, you know, continue it. That is something I do professionally. With Podify. Yeah, Podfly and then a few independent podcasts. Um, because the same thing what Rosie said is like, not having to wait for traditional media to pick you for a radio show or for a TV show. And I love podcasting. I feel like it's that the frontier where your message is, gets closest to people instead of being filtered out by advertisers or, you know, uh, companies or anything. Well, podcasting makes real change. Like, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but the whole Free Britney movement came from a podcast mm -hmm. and her whole thing with being freed from her conservatorship. And that vine of, leave Britney alone! <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's actually been, like, a lot of social change mm -hmm. through podcasting because, you know, people don't need you know, traditional media. They can just publish yourself. You're your own radio station. Yeah, and the relationship. I feel like we probably all have uh, the parasocial relationships in our head with either podcasters or radio people. And I know for me, too, like listening to someone daily, it, it just starts to get kind of in your groove of what you mm -hmm. think about. And They're um, in your brain, literally. Like yeah. they're, they're your subconscious at some point. Like, how close that, that all you And yes. then, final question. I haven't asked this question in a long time. It's one of my favorite questions to ask comedians because all right here's i'm going to preface this, the, the question this way there are no wrong answers i think sometimes comedians we get a little apprehensive about what i'm going to ask and so you want to steer toward like i think the more talented answer is this question or is this response there are no wrong answers you can only pick one or the other you can't pick both do you see yourself more as a performer or a writer and that that i mean do you write stand up because you have the need to perform or do you perform stand-up because you have the need to write? I'll start with me. There's an interesting conversation that started in my first year of comedy between me and other comedians in Baltimore that came up one day. One guy thought he was more of a writer. He writes and just goes and does stand-up because he has the need to write these things. I was like, I'm the opposite. I have the need to perform and I have to create material so I can go out and have a performance. And some people always were like, I feel like I'm, kind of, I'm both because and like, there's no right or wrong. No one is better than the other. Intrinsically, we'll start with you, Meryl. Do you see yourself more as a person who writes because you need to perform, or you perform because you have the need to write? Uh, what if I'm like I'm picturing myself as just like a lunch lady right now, <laughs> just just something random? Neither, but just some, serving people mashed potatoes. Um, a performer. You performer. Yep. Yeah. You th you write your material because you need to perform. Rosie, what do, what do you think? I heard everything you said, and I do not understand the difference. <laughs> I'm being dead serious. I don't understand the distinction. 
Well, I, uh, the distinction I think would be is, do you, are you comfortable, would you, would you, not that you do, would you feel comfortable doing stand-up if someone wrote uh, what your jokes? I think that is the difference. Do you, could you survive as just a writer for someone's, someone's stand-up? Because I wouldn't do that. I, could, I, I have I, written for other people, but that's not where I want my career to ever be. I want to be on that stage performing. And so even if I couldn't create my own material, I never would. But I would be as comfortable performing with someone else's material as I. I think that's the intrinsic So I think a little bit of both, but not strongly. Because I, I write all the time, and that's how I started, you know, writing for my ex. I think of funny things all the time in my mind. But also, um, like inappropriately, to the point where people are like, you know, <laughs> like multiple serious moments where everyone's like, you should not laugh at this, and I'm just laughing hysterically because I <laughs> think in my mind. But I've had, I've tried to hire comedy writers to write for me, and I had so much resistance to it. Mm. And even though the guy did write in my voice, he he was a writer for Jeff Dunham, and I I taught a stand um, a stand up for kids class with him, and he's like, let me write some material for you. So he's really good. He was a writer for Jeff Dunham, which means he's really good at writing with one hand and moving his <laughs> other hand. <laughs> I, I guess you just have to do it like this, Jeff. This is the performance of it all. Like, I just can't understand if you're not flapping your fingers like a mouth. Yeah, so he was a very talented Emmy Award winning writer, but he said, let me write some material for you. And he did, and I looked at it, and he's a talented award winning writer, and I had so much resistance to it. I was like, this isn't my voice, this isn't funny. But I did do it and perform it on stage, and it did get a laugh. So he obviously knows what he's doing, but it felt so uncomfortable for me. I think that makes you a writer because I think you you have to have your words, you have to have your writing. I think writing means I'm just saying and I, should, I, just, I, should, I love that this I should that conversation about comedy. Well, like I me. should I'm take that material, right? Writer. Every comic wants more material, right? But so he wrote pages of material I, for me. I can show you a lot of headliners throughout the New England have not <laughs> changed their material in 40 years. So no, not but, necessarily. I mean but. for free. He just did it for free because he liked me. He wrote me, you know, pages of material. And I think that makes him a writer because he's like, I just want to write. I, want, I don't care where it goes. I just wanted to write. But. And I, I just couldn't do I performed it. I got a laugh. People were laughing. It was funny material, but I was like, this isn't me. I, I don't like this. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for being a part of the, 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 the podcast. Thank you guys so much for coming to the podcast. Give yourself a big round of applause. Keep that applause going for our guests, Meryl and Rosie. Follow them online. Go to their websites. Google them. All the links are in the description. And there's no description for the people sitting here in the room. Again, thank you so much to Hell Yes Fest for, being, for allowing me to do my first one. I've been dead as well. Thank you so much. Get home safely, everyone. Good night. Ah. Uh...